Would you like to start in prayer and then we'll, I can do the demo or you can take attendance, whichever way you want to do it. Let's start with prayer. Let's do that. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and we thank you for this opportunity to learn more about uh, your love and grace uh, through your sacrament that you give to us through Jesus. Uh, so bless our time together, open our hearts and minds uh, to receive your word and receive all that's a part of that tonight. Uh, bless these kids as they get ready to uh, partake and celebrate with the rest of the congregation this amazing gift that you give to us all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I have a question for you. I have here a glass. Oops. Good catch. Thank you. I made it into the... <laughs> I did put a towel there just in case. So would you say that this is more full or more empty? More full? Okay. How about now? Empty? We have some agreement on that? So welcome. Come on in. Um, I'm going to put it in here like this. And now if you can see, get where you can see the bowl. What happens when I do that? Was the glass actually empty? What was in there? Air, right? So question for you, is air important? You've used air a bit today, <laughs> right? You're probably not thinking about it, but super important, right? What other things in your life that you can't see are important? My <laughs> microwave, right, like how you get your hot pocket or popcorn or whatever. Anyone make use of Wi-Fi ever anywhere? Yeah, pretty important. So tonight, you are going to be learning about something called the real presence. And we'll be learning that Jesus is in, with, and under the bread and the wine. Even though we can't see that, he's there. And so when you learn about that this evening, I'd like you to think about those things that we can't see that are super important. All right. Pastor Joe. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Let's hear it for Amy, huh? Uh, we got to give you like some kind of name for that, like the great amy -O or something, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, attendance seems like a good idea at this point. Let's start with there. Everybody okay with that? Awesome. Uh, Andrew Beam. Going once, going twice. Okay, all right. Rachel Clark. There we are. Uh, Caitlin Danielson. Uh, Ari Dossery. There you are. Um, Maya Elder. Maya Elder. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lily. Back in here, okay. Ray Hallett, back. Scarlett Hummerding, right over there. Thank you, Scarlett. Jack Hughes, paging Jack Hughes, paging Jack Hughes. No, okay. Um, Jack Jakes is on that email, right? Uh, Brendan Kaufman, there you are. Oh, see, Pastor Tom would love to see that sweater tonight. He would love to see that Bears logo right there. I got to tell you, that would be something he'd really enjoy. Brody Kaufman, right next to him, there we are. Fiona Kinahan. Isaac, they're online. Welcome. <laughs> um, Morgan Nyhouse. There you go. Good to see you, Morgan. Caleb O'Neill. Do I know how to get an entrance for you or what? Right? Like, right as you walk in, I'm calling Caleb's name. Like, that's just, that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Caleb O'Neill. Sorry. Uh, Ethan Palmer. Sorry, wait, yeah, right there. Thank you, Ethan. Jacob Park. Good to see you. 
Jack Pilot? Sophia Ridgeway. Say more. Say them twice. Zoe Ripple. There you are. Uh, Sawyer Roper. Say more. Okay. Ethan Schaus. Connor Schrader. Is it Schrader or Schroeder? I apologize. Schrader, okay. Rain Schaefer. Okay. Uh, Adam Stanek. Jameson Stenson. Lilia Warren. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Is that all you needed, Amy? Sounds good. Let's get into it, shall we? Uh, Pastor Tom mentioned last week, yeah, do you got a question? Oh, do you need a, a folder? And who else needs one? I'm sorry. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five folders. Is that right? Man, you are in luck because I've got six. Let me tell you. There you are. You bet. There you go. There you go. Gentlemen, there you are. Thank you. Thanks for raising your hand and asking. All right. So Pastor Tom mentioned that last week you got through question four. Is that correct? On the first page that we still need to go through question five tonight? Okay. Okay. A lively crowd. I always like that. Lively. Absolutely lively. All right, so let's, let's go through it, and then let's go back and just review uh, from last week. So that way we can at least get through it, and then we can go forward from there. So number five, holy communion, like baptism in the Word of God, are means of grace. They are ways or means that God promises to come to us. Does that make sense for everyone? You know, basically what we're looking at is how does God come to his people? Such an important question, right? Especially as we go through different stages of life, we're always asking those questions of where is God? Where can we see him? Where can we find him? Those kinds of things. And these means of grace are ways that we can answer that question, right? Because if we want to know where God is, we just look where he promises to be. And in this place, it's baptism, the Lord's Supper, and his word. Okay? So that's an important one. It, it's very short in terms of how succinct it is, but it really has a big impact as you keep going through it, right? Because there are going to be times you're going to ask, where is God? Why is he not here? What's he doing? What's going on? And there's an answer for you. It gives you a place to constantly come back to when those questions come up. Okay? Good? Perfect. All right. So you got to tell me, does Pastor Tom have you read those Bible passages, or what does he do with them with you? Have you look them up? Let's do that then. Let's go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Here's the next all-important question. Does he have you read them? No? No. Okay. All right. Well, I just didn't want to do anything different here. Didn't want to put anybody on the spot. Romans 10, 17. It was always fun when I was in confirmation. Everybody had the same Bible, and you could just tell the page number, right? Like you just say, go to page 542, and everybody's like, oh, sure, we could do that, right? Now you just got all sorts of Bibles out there. All good, all good. But when I tell you page 947, it probably means nothing to you, right? So, Roman, what was that? Oh, finding it? 1,327? Yeah, I don't think my Bible goes that high. Yeah, we might have problems there. <laughs> so, Romans 10, 17. 
it says, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Right? Anybody have a good definition of what faith is? I know this isn't on the sheet, but I just thought I'd ask. Anybody have a good definition? What does it mean to have faith? It's trust, right? In this case, it's trusting in God that we can't always see, right? Or know he's there, but know that he is. Trusting that he is there. Which then goes into that part about the ways, the means that God promises to come to us. It strengthens our faith. It gives us that increased trust that if God promises to be there, I know that's where I can see him. That's where I can find him. Okay? Cool beans? All right. Number six. Various names describe the meaning and purpose of Holy Communion. All right, here we go. Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Let's get there. What we're going to see is in three Gospels, the account of the Lord's Supper being instituted, being put into place. Okay? Matthew 26, 26 to 29. We there? Close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades? All right. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink of this, again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay? So that's one instance in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but we're just going to see it here in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So let's go to Mark chapter 14, 22 to 25. Mark 14, 22 to 25. We all there? Okay. It says, And as they were eating, he took bread, he being Jesus, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Similar language, right? Kind of hearing the same thing. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Verses 14 to 20. Luke's got a little bit of a longer definition or explanation of it, so he's more of the detail guy. As doctors are, right, Paul? More detail-oriented? Yeah. 14 through 20. It says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in, remem in remembrance of me. Excuse me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Okay? And then it goes on from there. So a lot of the same things. Luke goes in a little bit more detail. 
And Luke probably sounds a little bit more like what you hear on Saturdays or Sundays, right? When we say the words of institution, you hear a lot of the same similarities, right? A lot of the same things being said. It's meant to bring that word into the meal, right? And to share and to show what's going on. And there's one more passage there, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Right after Romans, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Everyone there? Okay. 23 to 26, it says, For I received from the Lord, and this is what Paul is writing here, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay? So all of those passages, all of them speak to and define clearly what the Lord's Supper is, that there's four parts to it, right? The body, the blood, the bread, and the wine. Okay? All important in understanding what is part of the Lord's Supper. Any questions about that at all? Going once, going twice. All right, let's go into the next part. So we have the various names that are used to describe what exactly we're celebrating. We've got the sacrament of the altar. We've got the Lord's Supper. We've got Holy Communion, and we've got the Eucharist. Okay? All terms that you can use, all of them are absolutely correct. So if someone says Lord's Supper and another person says Holy Communion, it's not that either of you are wrong. Okay? They talk about the same thing. All right? So why do you think it's called the Sacrament of the Altar? It's not a big theological thing behind this. Just take a look at the phrase there. What do you think? Where do we celebrate it? Altar, right? What sits on the altar? Sacrament, yeah. Sacrament of the altar. There you go. See? That's all it is. It's just a description of what's happening there. It's the altar on which we celebrate it, reminding us and connecting us to the altar and the table at Jesus' uh, last meal. And then it's also the sacrament, right? What we know and understand to be, which I think there is a review question about that here in a little bit. So you might want to have that ready to go. Okay? Does that make sense? Pretty easy, pretty logical there. The Lord's Supper, again, pretty logical. Why do you think we call it the Lord's Supper? Who started it? It's the Sunday school answer. Who started it? Jesus. Right? Jesus did. So it's his supper. That's why we call it the Lord's Supper. All right? He's the guy who started it. He's the guy who instituted it. And then Holy Communion. What happens when we take part? Uh, or I'm sorry, Holy Communion. So what happens when we take part in the Lord's Supper? We are sharing communion. It, it's not just a thing I do by myself. It's connecting us to Jesus. It's a community event that happens with the people here and the community with Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's something we do as a community of faith. It's also something we do with Jesus. That's the communion aspect, and that's what makes it holy. It's set apart. Okay? Good to move on to the Eucharist. Here's the fun one. There's some Greek involved with this one, okay? Eucharist, there's a word in Greek called charis, which means joy. So Eucharistia is thanksgiving. 
It's the meal of thanksgiving. That's why it's called the Eucharist. Okay? Any questions on that at all? Did we get that all covered for you? Did I confuse you enough? Yes? No? Maybe? Good. Okay. So let's go to session two, which I have <laughs> about 13 minutes to get you through it here. Kim, we might cut into your time a little bit. Does that work okay? Wow, that's so nice of you. You're a giver. Absolutely you are. So let's just, um, let's do this. Who can give me a review for the meaning of baptism? Anybody do that for me? What do you got? What do you got? Being accepted into God's family. The great meaning of baptism. That's what it is, right? Being brought into that family. Absolutely. What about sacrament? What is it? Who's got a good definition for me? Should be in your notes. Like baptism, Holy Communion is a sacrament instituted by God. It offers, say that again, louder. It was right, whoever was saying it. You just got to say it louder. For forgiveness of sins, it contains a, a physical element. Good, absolutely. So let's go into the nature of Holy Communion. We kind of talked about this a little bit when we talked about whose supper it is, but who instituted Holy Communion? What do you think? Not everybody has to answer at the same time. <laughs> Jesus. He instituted it, right? That's what we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Even Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about it. It was passed on to him. That's the guy who did it. That's the guy who started it. Okay, so Jesus. And in this sacrament, Jesus gives us his true what? What's the first thing? What do you think? We talked about it in those three passages. Jesus says, this is my body. Yeah, absolutely. His true body. And then a little bit later in those same uh, passages, and his true what? Blood. Absolutely. For the forgiveness of sins. So how can the visible elements of bread and wine also be the body and blood of Christ? We read one of those passages earlier, the 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26. It says, For what I received from the Lord I also delivered to you. I'm just going to read it again real quick. That the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay? So all of them are present there. It's not just the bread and the wine. It's not just the body and the blood. They're all there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Okay? But they're all there. And then let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Can we do that together? So 
1 Corinthians 10, 16. Is everybody there okay? Awesome. It says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Again, Paul lays out very clearly, there's body, there's blood, there's bread, and there's wine. Okay? So it goes back to that question that's in the, the study guide here. How can the visible elements of bread and wine also be the body and blood of Christ? How can they be that way? Just what God's Word tells us, right? That's all there is to it. I wish that there was something I could say like, well, when this happens, that's exactly how it goes. Or somehow like you pull back the curtain and you can see the transformation from bread you know, to you know, having the bread and the body or something like that. But all we know is God's Word tells us that. And it goes back into that trust, into that faith, that what God's Word tells us is actually the way it is. Okay? Any questions about that at all? So how can it be? God's Word just tells us it is. So there are different teachings concerning, the, uh, concerning Holy Communion. There's what we practice, which is called the real presence. Okay? You see that there on your sheet? Can everybody see that? Raise your hand if you could see that on your sheet. Awesome. Love it. Right? So the real present. The best way to sum that up is that Jesus' body and blood is really present in the bread and wine. That's why it's called real presence. Okay? Because the body and blood of Jesus are really present with the bread and wine. And so that's what we practice. And we use texts like 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 11 to help us understand that, to, to let that be kind of our guide as we practice and as we have our belief. Any questions at all about that? Okay. Transubstantiation. That's fun to say. Transubstantiation. Okay. So this is primarily a Roman Catholic teaching. And what the belief is here is that in the words being spoken by the priest, the bread turns into body, the uh, wine turns into blood. So now, after that change, there no longer is bread, there no longer is um, wine. Okay? It's completely changed into the body and blood of Jesus with nothing else left in it. Okay? So that's what's behind that belief, transubstantiation. And this is where we would disagree a little bit on that because as again, we look at 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, we see that everything there is present. The bread, the wine, the body, the blood. Okay? Any questions at all on transubstantiation? outside of maybe how to pronounce it again and again and again. So the bread and the wine transform into the body and blood. So then we have the Reformed Memorial Meal is often the title used. And this comes from the Gospels, right? Primarily the part where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, okay? So they take that to be that this is something we do just to remember the sacrifice, to remember who Jesus is and what he has done. There really isn't a promise attached to it per se, just something to do that strengthens your faith, that strengthens uh, your Christian life, if you will, in who Jesus is. So it's meant to be a way to remember who Jesus is and what he has done. Okay? That's the way a memorial meal is celebrated. It allows them to remember who Jesus is and what he has done. And in that meal, and you don't have to write all this down, there's a lot that goes into this, but in that meal, it's just bread and wine. Okay? There is no body and blood. It's just something they do as a remembrance. Right? 
But again, we go back to these 1 Corinthians texts and we say, hey, what about this? Right? It says pretty plainly here, there is body and there is blood, there is also bread, there is also wine. Okay? And when it comes to the sacrament, it's not about what you're doing there. You know, sometimes we, we do that with baptism. We do it with the Lord's Supper. It becomes about what I do, right? Or what happens to me there. In baptism, I make a promise to God. In uh, the Lord's Supper, I'm remembering who God is. But you got to go back to what a sacrament is, right? Which is God making and fulfilling his promises to you. It's not really about your promises in those places. It's about God's promise to you and what he's doing in those places, okay? That's a big difference. It's a big difference. So then again, you see the 1 Corinthians 11 text, 23, 29, the real presence of Jesus Christ in Holy Communion. And we talked about that already a little bit. We see everything there. The body, the blood, the bread, and the wine. It's all there. Paul records it that way. When Jesus talks in the Gospels, he says, this is my body, this is my blood, right? It doesn't represent, it doesn't transform or change, it just is, okay? And then there's that sacramental union in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Um, I'm going to read that again here. Just listen for that union, that togetherness that happens in the meal, okay? The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Okay, so there's that joining again, that holy communion, right? Where we're connecting and in community with God and who he is and what he's done for us. Okay, so that's the sacramental union. It's a place where we join together with where God is and where he promises to be. Any questions? Any concerns? Any complaints? Nothing? Okay. Everybody catching up okay? Everybody being able, everybody have enough time to fill things out as they go? Good? I'm going at an okay pace? Okay. Just want to make sure you can get that. Because he'll ask you these questions next week, right? So I want to make sure you're not just like, oh man, Pastor Joe went too fast. So... So then let's talk about <clears throat> excuse me, the reasons for receiving Holy Communion often. Let's go to John 15, verse 5. <clears throat> excuse me. we've kind of talked about this already at length in terms of why we would want to take communion often. But John 15, verse 5. It says there, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is, uh, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. It's actually my confirmation verse. So I enjoy that passage. It's a good one. But why do we receive Holy Communion often? Because it allows us to stay connected to the vine. I am. It keeps us connected to Jesus. During the week, you go out, you go to school, you hang out with friends, you do a lot of things, right? And you come back here and it gives you that opportunity to connect back to Jesus and who he is. Any questions about that at all? Okay. Then let's look at Acts 2, 42 to 47. So I don't know if your Bible has like little headers on the top of it. Mine says the fellowship of believers, and that's a big part of it, right? So it says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and then it goes on to talk more about that. But that's the big part. When they talk about the breaking of bread, that is talking about the Lord's Supper, celebrating it together. Okay? And so that's another reason why we receive Holy Communion often, is because it's something we do together as a community of faith. So not only does it connect us to Jesus, right, keep us connected to the vine, but allows us to remain connected to each other as we go through life together. Okay? Any questions on that at all? <clears throat> Good? All right. Let's go into the benefits of receiving Holy Communion. All right? Let's take a look at Matthew 26, verse 28. <clears throat> So again, we're looking for the benefits of Holy Communion. So just listen for that benefit here in Matthew 26, 28. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Right? So the forgiveness of sins, which Jesus' body and blood have won for us on the cross. That's one of the benefits. The forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> Ready to move on to the next one? Cool beans. All right, along with forgiveness, Jesus gives us blank. So we've got to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 8 to 9. Romans chapter 6, verses 8 to 9. <clears throat> All right, verses uh, 8 to 9, it says here, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died has been set free from sin. Oh, he went a little further back, I apologize. Uh, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So along with forgiveness, Jesus gives us life. Gives us life. Gives us life. And let's just take a little bit of a hop, skip, and a jump over to Romans 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse 10. Again, Jesus gives us what to live for him. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. And it says there, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Jesus gives us righteousness to live for him. Okay? Righteousness. Anybody have an idea of what that might mean? Let me ask you this way. How many of you are always nice to your parents? Raise your hand. Good. I, I, I see. A, okay. I appreciate the honesty in the back. Kind of. Right? Right? So 
one of the things that the Lord's Supper does is it strengthens us, right? And it allows us to be nice to our parents. It allows us to be nice to each other. That's what righteousness is. It's, it's doing good things, right? So that others may know who God is, okay? So that's what he gives us. He gives us the ability to do things that help others and serve others and love others, okay? That's what righteousness means. So then you see there in number five, his real presence goes with you. It's not like it stays in the walls, right? Just goes as you go. Wherever you go, wherever you end up, he's with you, okay? You know, there's nothing around here that kind of makes it stop at the doors or something. It goes all the way with you. To school, uh, to your friend's house, whatever you may got going on. Anybody working a job right now by chance? I just thought I'd ask. Your parents are. Good. That's a good thing. Yeah. Parents, for you, absolutely. Goes into your jobs, right? Goes home, goes to all the places where you are. So then let's take a look at that last bullet point there, that last number six. In this meal, Jesus says, I love you. Okay? Jesus says, I love you. Again, if you want to know what God's love looks like, if you're ever wondering, if you're ever questioning, if you find yourself going, man, I don't know that I believe this. Is this actually real? Where, do you can, where can you look? You look to the meal. And you'll always find that there. You always find God telling you he loves you. And the response of faith says, what do you think? I love you too. There you go. Absolutely. It's a great response of faith. I hope you don't leave your parents hanging that long. <laughs> when they tell you they love you. <laughs> yeah, Jesus says, I love you, and the response of faith says, I love you too. Okay? Any questions at all? All right. Well, Kim, I think it's time for your presentation. They need this sheet, correct? So if you got this sheet, you might want to take it out, get it ready. It's got all the pictures on it with the categories of items, use, name, and symbolism, right? Woo, field trip. Those of you who are joining us later online, uh, they're heading to a different room where they've got this all set up. Uh, just hang tight. Uh, Kim's going to come back here, and she's going to share the answers to the questions so you can get those too, okay? So just bear with us a minute here while uh, the in-person group goes on a field trip. Check. All right, you guys. So being the best teacher ever, I will give you all the answers for free. I'll even spell them for you. How about that? Super awesome. All right, so let's just start on the first page with what you see at the top looking like two plates. I'll call that the first page. Anyone want to guess what those are called? Raise your hand. Give me a shot. I'm going to make you all guess or I'll come point you out. Come on, somebody guess, somebody guess. The two plates, the two silver plates. Who wants to guess what those are called? It starts with the same letter. In the back. Yeah. Paten, that's right. P-A-T-E-N. Is that what you said? You're so quiet. Yes, those are called patents. Patents are what we put the wafers in when we serve communion. And there are big ones and little ones. We use the bigger ones to put the regular wafers in because most people take regular wafers. And then the little one you saw is for gluten-free wafers. So we separate them and we keep them far apart for those of you that want gluten-free. All right? All right, the next one down, and there's kind of an inset picture, so there's a picture of a big one and then a little one next to it. Anyone know what that's called? What do you think? That is the chalice, you're right. And the chalice that, that you're seeing the picture of, that's all straight and round on the top with no dips or marks, 
That is the main chalice that you'll see Pastor Joe and Pastor Tom use when they go through what we call consecrating the elements. That's a big word for saying the words that Jesus said on the Last Supper. So you'll hear the same words that Jesus said on the Last Supper when they consecrate, they talk about Jesus coming into our bread and wine in that mysterious way that we don't really understand, but we trust, we believe, we have faith in. All right, so that's called concentrate, con consecrating. And then you see the little cup. I bet those are, you'll recognize those little pottery cups because those are the cups we use when we commune. And do you see how they match? So those little cups that we use, are they look like a little mini chalice so that they match the chalice that Pastor Tom and Pastor Joe use. Now, you probably were here maybe over the last couple years, and we for a while we were using plastic cups. And a lot of churches do use them. And here's the thing. In all of this stuff that we're going to learn about on these sheets, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because you're going to forget all these words. I know you are, and so, most of the time I forget them, and I have to look back at the sheet. What I want you to think about when you look at all the things that we use for communion is this. There are levels of ways that we serve people at our house, right? So when, when I have friends over for pizza, we have, pa we have paper plates, and then we just throw them away. Um, when it's just our family, we use our kitchen plates, our regular plates for all the time. But when we have a really fancy dinner, and we invite a lot of guests to our house, we use our very best plates. And what we're doing up here is we're using our very best things. So we're not using plastic cups most of the time, A, because it's wasteful, but B, because this is Jesus that we're serving. This is Jesus' body and blood. And we want to use the very best. So all the things that we're talking about tonight, they have really fancy names, but just keep that in mind that we're just trying to use the very best because he's the very best, right? It's not because we think we're important, but it's because... We want to celebrate Jesus, so that's why we use what we use. All right, what's the next one underneath that chalice? It looks just like the chalice, but one little difference. What do you think? Absolutely, good. It's the pouring chalice, and the difference is what? It just has a little spout that we pour from. So when you come up for communion, we will pour into your little mini chalice from the pouring chalice. All right, how about those two glass containers? In our house, we'd call them a pitcher. <laughs> what do you think they're called? What do you think? Say it again. Yeah, flagon, F-L-A-G-O-N. But to be honest, when we're filling them in the back, I usually say, can you grab me the pitcher? <laughs> so I don't use that word very often, but that's the technical term for it. It's a flagon. All right, so at the very bottom, what you guys might call a napkin. It looked like a cloth napkin, right? What do you think they're called? Anybody? Those are the purificators. And what we use them for is when we're pouring the wine in your cups, when we come out to serve everybody in the congregation, we want to make sure we have something to catch any of that wine, but also, what are we pouring besides wine? Yeah, we're pouring Jesus' blood, right? We believe that they can be both at the same time. And so we don't want it spilling on the ground. We want to make sure that we're catching it in the right way. Okay, so we're, again, we're just doing our very best to honor and serve Jesus in the best way that we know how. All right, on the next page, you see that, sh that, um, that white cloth that was, I think, in that room, it was underneath the chalice. That's called the corporal. And what we do with it is when you'll see Pastor Joe this weekend when you come to worship, um, you'll see him set the altar. He'll say, everybody in your pews, get your kits ready. And then he's going to take the time to uncover the main chalice, and then he, it's almost like we're setting a picnic, right? He's going to put that corporal underneath and put the chalice on top of it. So that, again, in case he spills or if we, anything comes out, it's there to catch it. That square, little, um, that square little piece that you saw in there with the cross on top, you see that in the picture? Second from the bottom, do you know what that is called? Anybody want to guess anyway? What do you think? Nope, good guess though. That's called the Paul, P A L L. And the Paul is um, the only other time I've ever heard of a Paul is at a funeral. When we have a casket or when we have ashes, um, we place the Paul on top of it to remind them of their baptism. And um, that is what we're doing. We're placing the Paul on top of 
Jesus' body and blood, right? So we use the pall to cover it. And then the very last thing was the one that you mentioned is the veil. And that kind of didn't show up out there because I didn't have the same one that's in the picture, but that's kind of what we use just to cover everything up. So when we set the table for communion, we put veil, the veils or the cloths on top of everything to keep it covered because that's the second part of worship when we come in. First we do word, right? We read the scripture and pastor gives you a great sermon and then we do the sacrament. And then so we'll uncover the veil, we'll uncover the body and blood of Jesus and we'll get ready for the second part of worship when we do that. Any questions on any of those? Okay, a lot of big words really doesn't matter what you call them. What I want you to remember tonight is that when we serve communion, we do our very best for Jesus because he gives his very best for us. And that's why we use all these special things. All right? Good? How'd I do? Oh, wow. Look at me. 703. Not bad. You did pretty good. Absolutely. So I do know that there's one on there that you didn't cover, Kim. The bonus points. Why is there something on one of the handles? Anybody got a question or anybody have a thought on that? Why? What do you think? That's a good guess. That one's grape, Ooh, that's a really grape good juice, guess. but it's not. No, but that's a good guess. Really it good is, guess. But it is to keep it separated. So and we do good... separate the grape juice and the wine. Yes, yep. we do. What do you think? What do you got, Kim? All right. So we put the little charm on on all of the wine after we're done with worship that's been consecrated. So what that means is it's no longer just wine out of a bottle. Right now I have cases, cases of wine back there in my office, and it's just wine right now. When Pastor Joe this weekend consecrates it, says the words that Jesus says at the Last Supper, that's called consecrating it, and that's when we see that it's not just wine anymore. We have faith that Jesus' blood, because he said it in the Bible, not because we said it, not because Pastor Joe says it, but because Jesus said it, we have faith that it's wine and it's the blood of Jesus for us. And so when it's consecrated, we don't just dump it down the drain because we wouldn't do that with Jesus' blood. We have a very special way that we treat it in the back, okay? So that's just helping us to keep separated the wine once it's consecrated. Thank you for reminding me of that. No, That's a really important thing. Yeah, Same with the wafers when they're done. If you'll, you'll see if we drop them every once in a while, they'll be, get one dropped. We don't just throw them away in the garbage because it's not a wafer. It's Jesus. And so one of us will consume it or eat it. We have the five-second rule, but it lasts a lot longer here. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a story of Martin Luther when he was serving in a church. They had carpet on the stairs leading up to the altar, and he spilled some wine after it was consecrated. And so he cut out that square where the wine was and basically burned it because that would be the proper way to do it. Now that's the, the legend, but that's just how serious it is, right? We don't just toss it outside and let whatever happens, happens. There's a special process and procedure we have uh, to dispose of elements that have spilled or ones that we just can't use anymore because of length or whatever it might be. Good, thank you, Kim. Any other questions? Before we close tonight. All right. Pastor Tom is back next week. Hopefully you answer all good questions so they think I did a good job. Right? I'm trusting you on this. Um, but in all seriousness, I hope it was a great night for you to learn a little bit more about the Lord's Supper and just the uniqueness and the specialness that it has for us as people who celebrate it weekly at Beautiful Savior. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this gift of Jesus. We thank you for his body and blood. We thank you for this meal in which we could celebrate and commune with him and with each other. Uh, Lord, bless our time uh, for the rest of this evening. Bless our week and help us get ready for worship this weekend uh, that we may be drawn closer to you again as we get ready for another week. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.